Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and thanks to the Institute of Politics for hosting us. Um, we've got three out of our four really fantastic panelists so far. Um, hopefully Aaron can join us in a bit. Um, and they've really got a great range of experiences um, and hopefully lots of insights. Um, to start, you know, I'll go through a couple of my questions, um, but I wanna make sure we save as much time as possible for all of your questions. So we'll do about half an hour of each. Um, I'm not sure if, if Paula explained already, I apologize for joining a, a second late. Um, but if you have a question, just um, type your name in the chat. If you wanna include the question, great. I'll call on you. You can unmute yourself, turn on your camera and everything. Um, the panelists we have with us so far, um, I see Nicole Bibin Sadaka, who is the Chair of Global Politics and Security Concentration at Georgetown University's Masters of Science and Foreign Service. She spent uh, 10 years at the State Department. Uh, Dan Grant was the uh, Deputy Assistant to the Administrator for Pakistan and USAID on National Security and Foreign Policy and is now at GE. Um, Aaron Connaughton, um, who hopefully will join us in a bit, served as the Undersecretary of Defense uh, of the Air Force and of Personnel and Readiness at the Pentagon under President Obama. Uh, and then I'm Connor Finnegan. Uh, I cover the State Department for ABC News, um, reporting for radio, uh, digital, and live stream platforms, and producing for our uh, network broadcasts. Um, I actually was a graduate of the college in class of 2012 and an American studies major. So I'm sure you'll get far more out of this from uh, the other panelists than from me, um, who are all SFS grads. Um, just a little bit about um, how I got from the Hilltop to my current job. Um, I had a couple of media internships during undergrad. I wrote for the Hoya. I made a documentary film for my senior thesis. And um, one of those internships parlayed into a full-time job at CNN. Um, I started as a production assistant and I left as a writer and uh, an associate producer. Uh, at ABC, I briefly covered the Obama White House for about three weeks before moving over to our Sunday morning show um, this week, where I was the lead researcher and anchor producer. And I have covered the State Department now for just over three years um, since the beginning of the Trump administration. Um, so uh, let's turn to our three panelists. Um, uh, I'll have each of you sort of um, just introduce yourself and talk a little bit about how you got from the hilltop to where you are today. Uh, and Nicole, why don't we start with you? Excellent. Um, thank you for organizing this. Um, thanks to Paula for all of her work and for hosting Connor. And it's just great to see everybody and um, to see the interest from lots of students. Um, so my conversation is a little bit of how I got from the hilltop to the hilltop because I am there now, um, but obviously have not spent my entire career in academia. Um, as Connor mentioned, after my master's um, in, uh, in science and foreign service, I went to the State Department, spent 10 years there. My focus at Georgetown had been on refugee issues and conflict management, and I went to the Presidential Management Fellowship Program. Um, and started on refugees, but then moved my way into positions working on democracy and human rights for the remainder of my time there. Um, from there, um, we decided to go as a family overseas for uh, two years to Ecuador, um, and I went uh, to work for an organization called the International Republican Institute, which is a democracy support organization, and sort of stayed in that same democracy world. When I came back to Washington after that, I um, was actually, uh, got a call out of the blue from a colleague of mine who um, is my predecessor in this current job and asked me to just start as an adjunct while I was doing some consulting with a firm up in New York. And that then eventually a couple years of adjuncting on the side, then when this position that um, I'm in currently in um, came open, I threw my name in the hat and have been in this position at Georgetown for the last five years. So um, most of my work, both my day jobs, as well as the writing and consulting on the side have all been in the space of democracy and human rights, either in government or non-governmental. Um, so happy to talk about how those transitions work as well. Great, um, and why don't we turn over to Dan. 
and unmuted. Um, well, thanks. Uh, so mine, uh, my experience is something of a variant. It's more of a, a fusion of uh, policy and field work uh, overseas, along with uh, overt political work and uh, synthesis of the two that led to this. I was an undergrad uh, at School of Foreign Service and graduated in uh, late in 1996, right around the time when uh, the Balkan Wars uh, were in full effect and had just wound down under Bosnia. I went to uh, the London School of Economics graduate school after that. And uh, while I was there, a former classmate alerted me to the fact that a, an organization in Europe was seeking out people to monitor elections that had been mandated by the peace deal that had been set up after the Bosnian War had concluded. And that started the ball rolling for close to a decade of overseas work in post-conflict and stabilization work. And what I discovered was, uh, a lot of it was uh, I would go from one job to the next, from one country to the next, based upon the network of people that I had gotten to know. And uh, one's professional reputation would follow you uh, as if you were available, uh, capable, and uh, marginally not crazy uh, to wind up going to work in Kosovo and then Afghanistan and then Iraq after all these places. In between a lot of these events, uh, I punctuated it by being involved in democratic uh, politics, where um, while I was in Kabul, I uh, worked as a foreign policy analyst for the John Kerry presidential campaign and eventually returned to Washington to work on the foreign policy staff as a volunteer in that capacity. Because of whom I knew back in Kabul, I could uh, determine what was happening on the ground and report it up the chain within the campaign. Um, I then went back to Baghdad, and because of my time with the campaign and because of my time overseas, um, in 2008, uh, members of the Democratic Party in Austin, Texas, where I'm from, recruited me to run for U.S. Congress, which uh, was about as successful as the John Kerry campaign. Um, and this is a consistent theme throughout my political activities. Um, but as a result, I uh, wound up uh, setting up connections within local politics in Texas, um, but maintained my international uh, work as well. Um, and then this eventually translated into uh, the opportunity to, an accept, to accept the political appointment in the Obama administration, USAID, uh, in the Office of Afghanistan and Pakistan Affairs. Um, and they, it was common uh, under the Obama administration to look for people who had uh, technical and uh, field expertise, uh, but also might have had some sort of political connections. And uh, I fit the bill in that respect. And I stayed there until my services were no longer required at the beginning of 2017. And now I uh, work as a consultant for British Corps. Great. Uh, and Mike, why don't we turn to you? Sure. Um, so I will start by saying if there are any graduating seniors participating in this, I pass along my congratulations to you. Um, all of us remember our graduation from the university. You will probably have the most memorable one out of anyone. Um, I think, so my first observation, I'll, I'll talk about my career path and maybe sprinkle some observations in along the way that may or may not be helpful. I think the first thing I point out is most of you, if you're graduating or if you're going to soon graduate, you kind of have some vague notion of what you want to do or what issue areas you want to work in. The tough time you're going to have is that it's really hard. You don't know who does it. So I think of, for example, my first job, I went to work at a federal contractor, SAIC, Science Applications International Corporation, and I eventually wound up on a nuclear weapons project at the Department of Energy uh, in, with Russia, cooperation with Russia. And so I thought I knew the national security sphere, but I, I mean, it turned out I had no idea how many national security programs were actually run out of the Department of Energy. But once you get in places to things like that, then you get to see more what it is you're interested in and more actually who the actors are in that space. So for people that are looking for jobs right now or thinking about looking for jobs in the near future, uh, federal contractors, as much you know, as maligned as they may be, are also a fertile ground for places to look just because they're so large and they give you a breadth of exposure uh, to things you might not otherwise see. Um, I then made the mistake of going to law school I say that only half jokingly, but 
uh, the, for those of you that are contemplating going to law school, we can have all sorts of discussion about this. The main thing I will leave with you is to, you better think hard about the following question, which is, what is it that you want to do that you cannot do today because you don't have a law degree? Uh, I expect, I suggest you don't pay $200,000 to go figure that out. Uh, so think long and hard about that. Um, I came back from law school to work at a large firm in Washington, D.C. It was it's called Gibson Dunn. It represented George W. Bush and Bush v. Gore. Uh, when I left the firm, I wasn't actively looking to leave. I just, as it turns out, I met a friend of a friend at all places at the tombs. Um, he was working on the WMD commission, which was the commission to investigate why did the intelligence community think there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? So from there, I got my break on the Hill where I worked in a Senate leadership office, bounced back to the Department of Justice at the end of the Bush administration, somewhat validating my law degree, um, and then back to the Hill and where I ended up at GE today. I don't need my law degree where I did those jobs except at the Department of Justice, but I do use it. So I, that's another observation I'll make. For those of you that are contemplating jobs on the Hill. I've given presentations to the Career Center before of how to get a job on the Hill. So we could talk about that. There are many observations to make. The one thing that I would make right now is to say, for those of you that end up working on the Hill, whether you start as an intern or are working as the chief of staff, uh, make friends on the other side of the aisle. Uh, I did it. I wasn't very good at it, and I regret it to this day. Uh, I encourage you to think very intently about doing that if you're going to spend so many time on the Hill. Um, finally, just a quick observation. I now work in the private sector on the national security issues that I've always worked in in the public sector. I got super lucky in that respect. I work at GE. We do business in over 170 countries, so there's never a fact pattern that isn't enjoyable. But those are kind of, that's my path and some of the observations I would make along the way. That is great. Thank you, Mike. Um, I think what's interesting about all three of you um, is this meandering, I think sometimes has a bad connotation, but but you all took very um, meandering paths to get where you are and and try different things in different parts of, of this very broad national security field. Um, so I guess my first question to all of you would be, what do you think is sort of the through line in your career? Was there, you know, an overarching goal of, you know, if it's nuclear weapons or, or nuclear policy or, uh, you know, alleviating poverty or something? Or was there a dream job you were working towards? Was there an area of expertise you felt like you wanted to hone? What was sort of that through line throughout? We could start with Nicole, yeah. Yeah, I'll jump in on that. That was a lot of really great questions that probably each of us could do an hour on separately. Um, just a couple points of advice to pull some those questions together. One is find what your passion is, right? And that one passion doesn't have to be the one thing that you're going to stay with for the next 60 years, but, but find something that you're excited to do to um, wake up and get out of bed. And that could either be an issue. For me, it's democracy and human rights. For other people, it is... Um, a, a type of action. Some people love legal analysis, but they don't care what they're do, whether they're doing it on democracy or they're doing it on national security, but there's something that gets you out of bed. Um, I've never been one to, um, to direct my entire career to say, I'm doing all of this to become X on X date. And I don't know that even the Madeleine Albrights of the world um, have, have done everything in order to get to one place as much as they have done two things, which is be excellent at what you're doing right now. And, you know, going back to Dan's excellent point, which is, um, you know, he was good and his reputation was built um, as a person who's excellent at what he's doing and opportunities sprung from that. So that's my second point is one, um, be excellent at what you do because your reputation will always be with you. And that more than your resume <laughs> will probably be what opens doors for you. And the second is, Keep your eyes open for opportunities, right? Be excellent at what you do, but don't put your head down. Be aware of what the ecosystem around you looks like, who's doing what, and where opportunities exist. Dan or Mike, do you want to jump in on that? Uh, I'll go and then pass over to Mike. Um, uh, I, I just echo that. Uh, I found that um, as a, a general overarching through line is I've always had an interest in politics. <laughs> 
affairs and that sustains them in life. Some will be more fulfilling and interesting than others. Some will be shorter than you would like. Uh, some you might be forced to, to stay because you just bought a house um, or, or something like that. But there's always been a similar character to all of them. But your overarching uh, career path will build upon itself. The, the biggest thing that I've noticed uh, in terms of how things unfolded is to expand on Nicole's point about uh, your resume. For me, it's overall who you wound up knowing and, and not necessarily in terms of an old boys network or anything like that. It's just that in your particular area, you're going to wind up creating a, a series of professional contacts whom you know and will be able to refer you. Um, and the one truism I have found about uh, uh, government work, political work, but particularly internationally charactered work is that it is a massive free-floating high school. There is uh, a, the likelihood of there being maybe two degrees of removal from everyone in it is pretty stark. Um, and so your ability to just know people, uh, demonstrate that you're capable of doing what you're doing will pay off over time. Every job that I have gotten has wound up being as a result of some past experience and referral from somebody else. Uh, you have to go through a resume process for some of them, but what really pushed it over the line uh, was uh, the, the network that you had built up on top of that. And so this is, Mike, I would just echo that. So as you can imagine, for example, in my current job, I work at GE and they required you to apply online through their uh, resume service to go through the process. You can imagine how many people applied for that, right? Like it wouldn't be, 10,000 people could have potentially put their resume in. I knew someone that was working on the floor here and through my times on the Hill, which is the only way that my resume got brought to the top of the pile. I mean, that's it. And that's just to Dan's point, exactly what you will need for something like that. Uh, to answer Connor's specific question, I always knew that I wanted to be in the national security space, and I got lucky that I've been able to do that. My first job was a nuclear weapons job. Uh, then I worked on Iraq intelligence issues at the Department of Justice. I was on the national security team, and in the Senate, I had the national security and foreign policy portfolio within the professional field. Uh, your first job out of school, especially if it's on the Hill, for example, you know, you might be photocopying things. Who knows what's going to happen in this current circumstance, but you might be photocopying things, or you may be helping, you know, write, answer letters from constituents or take phone calls from constituents. You know, I just ask you, there's no job that will ever be beneath you because even to this day, I'm very much on occasion still a glorified travel agents for many of our people here at GE helping arrange meetings with senior officials. But then if you do that well or any other tasks that you're given well, I'm also talking to the Deputy Secretary of State about international trade issues in a pandemic. So I just encourage you, as you're working along your path, it is Washington DC is a large city, but it's really not. And just be humble and personable in everything that you do around here. Mike, if you want to make uh, an introduction to the Deputy Secretary of State, that'd be very helpful for me. <laughs> Go ahead, Nicole, sorry. Can I just, yeah, add one point? I, I couldn't agree with um, more with what both Dan and Mike have said. I want to just add one point um, because there, whenever I have conversations with my students, there's one thing which makes the anxiety level just jacked to the roof, which is when you start talking about networking and you talk about it's who you know and, you know, and things like that which I think is absolutely true, but let me just put the asterisk on it so that you hear our comments, which I w agree with fully, in the right way. When you do your any job well, you're automatically networking, right? So when we say the word networking or you say it's about who you know, don't think it's about the schmoozy guy who's like at the cocktail parties every weekend. Think about, gosh, 
when I'm researching a paper and I really want to understand something, I'm picking up the phone and I'm calling the experts and I'm talking to people. I'm talking to my professors who know that topic, or I'm talking to my friend who interned at a place that works on that. That is in essence networking. And what it is, it's you're doing your paper really, really well by talking to other people. And when you're in any job, you're gonna do your job better if you're talking to people, you're talking to experts, you're talking to the people who used to have the job, whatever it is, that's what we mean by networking. If you're doing your job super well, you are building those linkages and people are also seeing you and how you work and your reputation is being built, not because you're schmoozy, but because your talents are just on display constantly. And so when you hear the comments from all three of us, hear them in that context, of do your job super well, build those relationships as you go in the organic way that comes in Washington and most other cities, and um, just be present in those in those circles. Yeah, that's a great point, Nicole. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the dividing lines I think between the three of you um, is your own involvement in politics. Um, and so I wanted to ask, you know. It, was there a point at which you decided I am a, you know, capital D Democrat or, or a Republican and that is how I'm going to craft my career? Um, or, or um, you know, in, I guess in Nicole's situation, how has the, the fact that you're less involved in party politics maybe closed doors for you or, or opened opportunities? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so I have chosen to work on a number of campaigns. Um, not successful campaigns, but campaigns. Um, and um, that's how I have chosen to get involved, as well as be part of the foreign policy conversations that exist within um, different parties. So I'm an independent who leans right. So most of my affiliations have been um, with the Republican Party. It's not the candidate that I support this election. It's not the one that I supported last election, but it is the one who I supported, the candidates that supported in the previous elections. Um, so my, I see myself as a foreign policy expert in this space. And when there is an opportunity to engage in political work related to that, I choose to do that, and that's mostly through campaigns or writing on a perspective that is center right. Um, I think it's a really, really important thing that we have experts in the political process, that we have experts in the career um, diplomatic and civil service world and in the private sector, and all of those people have a sense of both who they are politically as well as who they are vocationally. Sometimes that overlaps and sometimes it doesn't. Mike or Dan, you want to jump in on that too? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, yeah, I'll start and turn to Dan. I guess, I mean, to be fair, it, you could probably put me with a therapist to figure out how I became a conservative Republican. I would have no idea how to explain that. But really, the only place where I think, the main two places where it was a not a driver for me, but where it's an important factor is I did know that I wanted to work on congressional staff at some point in my life. And I'm just gonna be frank with everyone here. Um, you gotta pick a side. Uh, it is, there's no concept of a career. There's very, I shouldn't say that. You can probably count on two hands the number of career jobs there are on the Hill. You're either working for a Republican office or a Democratic office. And they will care that you can uh, demonstrate your commitment to their boss's uh, political preferences, uh, some more than others but that will matter for the hill and as dan will also i'm sure echo it will it matters for political appointments in the executive branch i was a political appointee to the department of justice under president bush dan was at usaid under president obama um you i would have never been a political appointee in an obama administration it would it, it would have been impossible to do given my resume um I, th that's not a good or bad thing that's just the facts as they say um, I never used it as a driver to say, well, I've got to pick a side so that I can get job X, Y, or Z. It's just kind of the reality of most of you will kind of know what side you're on now at this point anyway. And then certain possibilities will present themselves to you, uh, whether that side is in political power or not. At, in a career job, you know, applying through USA Jobs or anything like that at the State Department or any federal agency, it is actually unlawful for them to inquire about your political preferences. So that's where it wouldn't matter at all. So it really just kind of depends what you want to do at that point. 
Dan, do you want to jump in, but specifically sort of address, um, you know, your congressional run, not to to bring up any bad memories, but but what made you decide that running for office would be sort of the best way to advance uh, your foreign policy career? Well, um, the running was something of an unexpected event. Um, I, I'd been involved in the Kerry campaign. Uh, there had been redistricting in my, uh, in the Austin area, and there was a relatively new, somewhat competitive uh, seat that had opened up. Well, not opened up, it was occupied by a Republican, but was considered to be reasonably competitive. And I had been marginally involved from Baghdad in that race uh, in, in 06. Um, the 06 elections happened and the Democrats uh, took the House of Representatives and the Senate and 08 was coming up and the Iraq war had been going rather badly. And it was one of the few times in an American presidential cycle where foreign policy was very much the forefront and it remained that way until the economy collapsed. <laughs> oh, what heady days. Um, and uh, as a result, there was an interest in candidates who could uh, speak cogently on foreign policy. And I happen to be from that district and uh, specifically was in Iraq, which was right in the center of things. And so I was approached and I hadn't really considered ever running. I mean, uh, I am certain that 75% of all students at Georgetown have a vague notion of maybe doing it at some point. Um, uh, but it's something that you really have to consider seriously. And so when it was pitched to me, I thought, I, I, I mulled it over and I thought, well, why not? Um, it'll be a chance to do it. I, I was fortunate in a way in that my uh, responsibilities were, were much more limited. I, I wasn't married. I didn't have children. I had much more freedom of movement. So the risk to me in doing it was, was fairly low because if you run as a candidate, that is your job. Then you need to be prepared to do nothing but raise money and forego having an income the entire time to do it. Um, and I lost. But it wound up being one of those things that has propelled me forward in my career in other ways that I hadn't anticipated. By having spilled blood on the behalf of the Democratic Party and uh, working on the Kerry campaign, and then I wound up working on the Hillary Clinton campaign in 2016, it, it was a demonstration to the party that, that I was considered to be uh, the member of the team and therefore a credible candidate for an appointment. Um, but the campaign, I mean, I ran to win. I, I badgered friends and family and people I didn't know for money and gave it my all. But, you know, that's the nature of it. It's binary. I just um, reiterate Paula's uh, note in the chat. Um, if any of the students um, have questions, um, go ahead um, and just submit your name or submit your question. We can call on you. Um, while we wait for some of those, um, just one quick question, something that Mike had, had touched on. Um, when when your party then is out of power, how do you think about your career? What are what are the ways that you can sort of advance it? Um, you know, when you can't get a, an appointment at uh, one of the agencies, or or you're in the minority on the hill. So, for me, what, the way I approach it, I was in the Senate, so being in the minority minority kind of mattered a little bit. You know, it'll be my own personal observation in the minority in the house while entertaining. It's also kind of almost a little bit irrelevant. Um, it's just the, the nature of our political system, but it's not all jobs, you know, are necessarily inherently political. For example, one of the things that I very much considered, I like to read and write, and that's what I did in my job on a daily basis on the Hill. And I thought very intently about going to a think tank for a very long time and is kind of apolitical. I mean, to be fair, if you go to like Heritage, you're going to have to demonstrate some conservative bona fides. But there are many other think tanks that they're mostly apolitical, and it's truly is. The professor, Nicole, could easily talk to this better than I could. But they're apolitical jobs, but they're in your issue space that you care about, and it just keeps you involved in that area. Really, if your fortunes are tied, there's a very small subset of all of us that are, where your fortunes are fought, tied are really directly to the political party that you're serving. Beyond that, I mean, like I said, that's such a small circle. I happened to be in it a couple times, but that wasn't like an active goal of mine. It's just where I ended up. But in the meantime, if your party, if your fortunes are tied to them, there are other ways to search it out. But don't, don't also be worried about the fact that if you find yourself in that circle, it's a nice place to be, but it's also a very small circle too. I, I think I, Mike makes an excellent point. And I think one thing which is important as people are listening to all of these comments 
is understanding this entire ecosystem is step one, right? There's, there's work that is inherently political, there's work that's inherently apolitical, there's work that sort of straddles between. None is right or wrong, it's what's right or wrong for you as an individual. And you just gotta know what you're buying when you go one direction or another, right? If you are a politically oriented person, then yes, yeah, sometimes you're in power, sometimes you're not. That's the great thing about democracy. If you are in an apolitical career job, say at State Department or Defense Department or USAID, then you are serving whatever administration comes in and you've got to be ready to do that. So if you lean one direction and you really bristle, if you have to work for someone in another administration, tough luck if you're a civil servant or a foreign service officer. And there are pros and cons of both of those. It's not that one is inherently right. It's that each of us has an inclination in one direction or another. And that's an important thing while you're a student is to think about how, how much can I roll with the goods and the bads of that part of this Washington ecosystem or this international affairs ecosystem? And do I wanna bring my talents to a more political position or do I wanna bring my talents to a more career position? And um, that's, a, that's a good question to wrestle with at your age and stage for those who are on the call. Great. Um, we have a first question from Alexis. Hi. Um, so this is mostly for Ms. Sadaka, so I'm also interested in human rights and democracy, specifically in Latin America, where you said you went to Ecuador. That's fantastic. Um, so I was wondering what your different, your, the differences in your experiences were between government and non-governmental sectors and kind of what main things you would tell someone is, you know, looking into different careers, um, things to consider as they kind of decide between taking up a job in either, either sector. Yeah, it, it goes to the same, thank you for the question, Alexis, and keep sticking with democracy and human rights. Um, it goes to the same question of what does the ecosystem look like and what are you willing to, what are the pros and cons of whatever sector? If you're in government, you carry the weight of the U.S. government. That is, and you, and you serve the people of the United States, that is a huge honor and a tremendous, um, a, just a tremendous opportunity to serve. With that comes the reality that your issue that you love and would die for is one of many, many, many issues. And you've got to live with the fact that you're, you're going to be fighting within your own bureaucracy to get your issue on the table. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And at the end of the day, you still have to salute and march forward and represent the government because you have to speak with one voice. In the NGO world, you don't have to do that. You have the flexibility to... Um, to represent your organization's view, which could be critical of a government, could rely with the government, it could pivot from one day to another. You have a ton more flexibility, but you don't walk in the room carrying the weight of an entire country. You have the freedom to say what you want in a much different way. I, and again, I don't think that there is one that's inherently better or worse. It is a question about where you think that you feel most comfortable based on the culture, and I don't mean national culture, I mean culture, organizational culture, um, do you want to work in a larger bureaucracy? Do you want to have your issue be one of many? Do you want it to be the top issue, but you're not working in, and you're working in a more nimble organization? NGOs also have to deal with the issue you're chasing money all the time, and you work at the um, pleasure of the funder to some extent. So you have to understand what the cultural differences be between the two are. I've loved my service in both. Uh, there were pros and cons. There were days that I had to grip my teeth and there were days that were absolutely glorious in both. So understanding, and I would say if you're a student, intern at both, get to know the culture from the inside and then see which one is a personal fit for you. Thank you. Great. Uh, next up, uh, Zev. Hi, I'm Zev. I am a rising junior and I'm studying international politics, concentrating on security, then minoring in Russian and mathematics. And my question for all three of the panelists, and uh, even for you, Mr. Finnegan, if you want, if you have advice on this topic, is how do you begin to make those initial connections? I know there was the metaphor earlier of DC and kind of international affairs being like a high, high school. So how do you even get an invitation to the party to begin with when you're still in college? Any thoughts? Um, in turn, um, get to know your professors and when you're doing your paper research well and get to know who the experts are. I think Dan made the point that on every issue, there's only like 
200 people <laughs> working on every issue. So if you're writing a paper about refugees in Burma, who's doing that? Get to know them, interview them for your, for your paper. They love knowing that there's someone who's coming into their tribe, right? Like if I'm a Burmese refugee person, I wanna know who else cares about the things that I'm passionate about. Um, and you're in a town which is, I call it like the circus of international affairs. There are experts on everything. Go to events, get to know the experts. Um, so those would be the four recommendations I would have. That's great. Dan, you had your, your hands up. Oh, no, I was just going to echo that. I mean, uh, this is a company town in the way that if you're interested in tech, you go to Silicon Valley. If you want finance, you go to New York. I mean, uh, in terms of uh, both uh, politics, policy, international affairs, the focal point for the United States is Washington. And so um, there, the city is rife with events and uh, uh, gatherings where you will find people who are experts on particular subjects who will hold forth on things that are completely open for you to go to. You just you know, go to Brookings or Heritage uh, or Cato Institute, whatever, and sign up to go and see you know, Professor X or Implementer Y and go there. And they're happy to talk to you, generally speaking. Um, and this, the advantage that being at Georgetown is that you have that at your fingertips within the city. Just get on the G2 and head to wherever you need to. Um, and, uh, you know, and there's nothing, it, it, there's nothing wrong with being um, ambitious for yourself in terms of just going up and asking. Um, you know, be polite, but people are accustomed to being asked specific questions on policy. Hey, can you help me out? Hey, I have more questions. Can I talk to you and get a cup of cut a cup of coffee later. I think the most profitable industry in this city is anybody who sells coffee mm -hmm. because it is the lubricant for the functioning of the city. And so this is Mike, I, I'll steal all that and adapt it from, like I said, I've given presentations at Georgetown in the past on how to get a job on the Hill. And I'll just say it forthrightly. You know, I, I hate the word networking. Like we, as Professor Nicole said, like that's really what networking is. I'm terrible at put me in a room and go talk to strangers, but abuse the Georgetown network. Um, really, you are, you probably, if you're a sophomore or junior, you will probably know one or two people who are now one or two years out of Georgetown. And if you don't, your professors do, or someone does, and you say, I'm interested, like I said, I'll use the Hill example specifically because it's the easiest for me, but you can adapt it to your particular pursuit. Who do we know that's a legislative correspondent working for a Republican in the House? You could swing a cat and you'll hit 20 of them from Georgetown, I guarantee it. And your professors probably know them. And you know what? Just call, email them and say, I would like to meet you and talk about your career path. Um, I, I'm not gonna adapt that to the current circumstances of COVID because it's gonna look entirely different. So let's pretend that you were in 2019, you literally would have gotten on the guts bus or whatever you call it now and gone downtown and you go to the Hill and you go to their office. And on a Friday afternoon, you sit and talk with them. And I assure you, if they're one or two years out of Georgetown, they will meet with you and they will talk with you. And then they will recommend, oh, talk to my friend here or, oh, you're from this city, you really should meet so-and-so. It becomes natural. And that's why I think what Nicole said, don't, I hated it, I'm terrible at it, but don't fear it. You just kind of throw yourself at it. And so really as a specific advice, abuse the Georgetown network, find those people. For you specifically, Zev, or all of you that are close by, you probably want to hit people that are one, two, three years out because they'll be able to tell you what their experience was like in trying to make that first move. I mean, mine was so many years ago, I've since forgotten it. But if I were to receive an email, me, Mike Stransky, from a Georgetown student, that said, I'd like to come talk to you, I'd take it in a second. I wouldn't hesitate it because the other advice I say to people is once you make your way onto the hill or once you make your way wherever, you got to pay it forward and people are going to come to you and you got to do the same thing for them that you, they just did for you. And so, like I said, if anyone here were to write to me or I would not think, I would not hesitate to answer it and to have that conversation. In your shoes, what I really advise is you got to be respectful of how it's our time. For example, if you're looking to the Hill, find them when they're on recess. Their Mondays through Thursday when they're in session are nightmares. You want to get them on Fridays or get this week, for example. The Senate is in recess. This week would have been a perfect time. July 4th, 
this, you'll find the, the August calendar. You just, that, that's the easiest one that I can talk to, but really that's what, I, I, I'm gonna be no more crass or blunt than that, but there's a Georgetown network, you paid a lot of money to have it, uh, you should abuse it. The other thing I would add to that, Mike, is the network will also look out for you. Um, and, and to your point, the Georgetown alums out there are always happy, always excited, I think, to sort of do that and, and pay it forward and everything. Um, I know for me, my first job at CNN was because my boss, my direct hire, was a Georgetown alum. I had interned for her and she really liked me. Um, to Nicole's point earlier, you know, you prove yourself and that, that alone is networking. So it's that combination uh, of those two things. Um, I want to add to, just yeah, real yeah, quick on ahead. that. Um, I was hired, and, and again, I was hired by two Georgetown alums in my second and third job. And I will say, I'm not, I, I will try and be humble, but also I was not hired because I was a Georgetown alum. I was hired because they had seen me do other things and my reputation preceded me, but then they knew, wow, I know what type of training she came from. So it does carry an additional cachet. Second point is um, students often don't see the entire picture because they are just starting out at their career. All of us, I'm sure, get calls from people who are under secretary levels, <laughs> mid-level, and 20-somethings, um, and everything in between, which tells me that everyone is out looking and networking at all times. So it is not singularly, when, they're, when you're knocking on a door, you are not just the junior person knocking on a door. There are people who are at the undersecretary level, at the assistant secretary level, who are also out knocking on doors. It's just what everyone does at some point. So it's something that students shouldn't be afraid of engaging in. Great. Um, Gwyneth, Gwyneth Murphy. Yeah, hi. Um, so I am a rising sophomore. I'm studying international security and religion, ethics, and world affairs. And this is uh, mostly for Mr. Str uh, Stransky, but I was wondering um, what are some of the specific skills that I should be building, like language or cyber, any kind of like very specific skill that could aid me in my pursuit of national security work specifically? I will rely upon my colleagues to help me on this, but I'll give you two that specifically come to my mind just from my experiences. Um, I'm not saying you should pick a foreign language skill based on like what careers you want to have. But if you happen to know Arabic or Chinese, the intelligence community, for example, is going to take great interest in some of your skills and probably you will, you will be an attractive candidate to them if you were to apply. I'm not saying that that should be a driving factor in what language skills you possess, but that it will be something that will set you apart and be very, very helpful. Same thing, the cyber security space is going to be its own thing. It has been for the next 10, last 10 years. It will continue to be for as long as I'm on this planet, certainly. Um, how to get those skills is, I mean, I'm sure, I haven't looked at the Georgetown curriculum. I have to imagine there's tons of cyber security classes at this point, or there's certainly professors in residence or adjunct professors who worked in that space and are teaching classes in the evening, for example, and they do it professionally during the day. Um, those, you mentioned them, so I'm just ratifying what, what you said as the, those are kind of two specific skills that, while also enjoyable, would be helpful, but I'm, at the same time, like don't necessarily, I would never counsel anyone to say, oh, take class X because you need that to get your job. That's just not realistic but those general skill sets of showing a thematic body of work maybe within your undergraduate work some of those language skills or in that technical space in cyber uh are, i mean i'm putting you saying you're on the right path if you're thinking along those lines well cool. all right um there is a question for dan um from francesca yes hi i'm francesca i'm just graduated so i'm a senior Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and so my question is very practical in a way, is what would be your advice to like me, somebody my age, how to get to the countries that you were in? So countries are unfortunately still in conflict. Right. Um, uh, there is a cottage industry of organizations that functions in places that are either in current or post-conflict democratization, reconstruction, that sort of thing. One of the people that you should talk to immediately after this is Nicole because of her connections with IRI. 
um, the Interna uh, International Republican Institute. I used to work when I was in Iraq for an organization called IFAS, which is a uh, sibling organization to IRI, funded through the same congressional mechanism. There, there's a host of them out there. And um, uh, there, if there is a willingness on your part or anyone's part to go to these places, you're ahead of most of the crowd to begin with. Um, uh, because there is a constant uh, need for not just capable people, but ones who are actually physically present in this place. Now, a, a lot of it is going to be, there's going to be a lot of graduates in a similar position as yourself who are coming out of GW or coming out of uh, Harvard, wherever, who are interested in doing field work uh, in conflict zones or post-conflict zones. Um, but you do have a home field advantage of where a lot of the organizations that field them are headquartered out of here. And so uh, just ask around for IFAS, NDI, IRI, oh, USIP. I mean, there, there's an alphabet soup, IOM of, of all of them. And I'd be happy, and this is how it happens, I'd be happy to give you a, a short list of organizations to look into. But then also think of the countries in question that you might be interested in going to, or if there's a particular um, uh, uh, a conflict or nature of it that's of interest to you. Um, and there will be corresponding organizations that you can approach. Um, and then finally, uh, at least once, uh, I went to, uh, I went back to Afghanistan before I had locked down a follow on job, but because I had already worked there on one assignment, um, I knew enough people on the ground that it took me a little bit of time to lock down something because there's always a preference, always a preference to hire somebody who's qualified and is there <laughs> um, versus having to recruit somebody from 10,000 miles away. Um, but but you, you have the aperture for finding out information by being in DC, even if it's by video screen. Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, we've got uh, Zachary, um, who actually has a question that was on my list as well. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so I know, oh, I'm Zach. I'm currently a junior at the School of Foreign Service studying international politics. Uh, I'm from New Jersey right now. Um, so my question, you kind of bre you kind of breached the question a little bit, but I wanted to get more specific. Uh, I recently just finished an internship on the Hill. Um, just where I was interning for a senator. And I'm really interested in international politics, so I kind of talked to people about that. Um, and a lot of their response was that, like, it's a very niche space. There's only, there's very little uh, amounts of people that are actually working on the Hill, specifically on foreign policy. And a lot of it's also constituent driven. Um, and you guys, including Dan, talked a lot about your campaign experience. So I, my question is really, um, how did you kind of find those spots where domestic and international politics really intersect? And then once you did, how did you strike the balance between the two? Um, like Dan said before, when you campaign, uh, asking people for money is like all you're doing. You're not really involved in the international stuff. So how did you personally kind of reconcile that and figure out okay, I'm going to do dive right into domestic politics now, and then five months later, I want to be back on the international stuff. Can, I'll, I'll take a stab at that, and I would, let me differentiate between a couple terms. I would use the terms foreign policy and domestic politics, and I would differentiate between them. Every administration, every senator, everyone has what what they see is their domestic policies and their foreign policy, which means every political actor, every politician has to take a position on a foreign issue and a domestic issue. Politics is the action of engaging people on um, the political spectrum to engage them on your party's issues. And so where those two meet is it's about rallying the people in your political orientation, so rallying other Republicans or right-leaning people who want to vote for the policies that you believe are best. And so um, it's about thinking, of, it's about identifying which foreign policies you think are best, right? Most of us in SFS at least are, are foreign policy oriented people. What are the policies that you think are best and what is the political party? How do you align with the political party, right? And so if you believe that the Republican party represents the foreign policy vision or the Democratic party um, represents the, um, 
foreign policy vision that you agree with and you want to contribute to that. Both of those parties have active um, networks of people who are actively engaged in shaping that, thinking about those issues, um, and, and then obviously um, working to get the politicians who share those views elected at any number of levels. And so the intersection, there is an intersection certainly because it's about the political machine getting people elected who represent foreign and domestic policies that you, um, that you agree with. And so it's really about getting into the Republican foreign policy circle or the Democratic foreign policy circle. And there are very, very large circles in both parties. And if you look, President Trump during his campaign, President Bi uh, Vice President Biden right now has a whole massive cadre of people who are, um, who are active in foreign policy. And so there are circles on both um, where those intersect. Uh, just to, uh, to illustrate that point, when I worked on the Hillary Clinton campaign, I was on the South Asia foreign policy team, and there were about 50 of us. And it totaled out to maybe a thousand advisors. It was like a miniature State Department uh, that, that was functioning wholly in support of the campaign. And that, that is how it tends to work. Zach, the, one of the things I want to make sure to say to you of someone who just came off an internship is stay in touch with the people you were working with there. Um, even if it's like a month from now, you come up with some excuse to write the people you are working with an email. Like, oh, I'm doing this, or you know, I just left New Jersey to go here, or I saw that your office did this, how's it going? Like, just find some excuse and get in the habit of doing that. Um, because your observation is correct, that on the Hill particularly, I don't want to generalize beyond that, on the legislative branch in the Hill, the policy community for international uh, relations issues, it is small. I mean, it's the dream jobs or what I would consider the upper echelon jobs are, you know, you're working on the committee of jurisdiction, either Senate Foreign Relations or House Foreign Affairs Committee staff. And next in the next circle to that is you always want to kind of be working on a mem with a member who at least cares somewhat about your issues. So if you're not working on the committee staff, you probably want to target members who are on that committee, uh, at least mid-level. On the and the Senate side, they're all going to be senior enough. On the House side, you know, the more senior, it's they're going to be more engaged. But there are also members, and this is just being up there. You'll figure out there are members that aren't on committee, but they cared about they care about an issue a ton. So my, it, and that is really hard to figure out. You're just, that's like true, just paying attention, reading the news, talking to friends. The specific example I used, I worked for John Kyle and he was probably considered the leader of the Republican foreign policy thought, of Republican thought, uh, foreign policy thought leader in the late nineties and two thousands. And he was never on the armed services or foreign policy, foreign affairs committee. He was on the intelligence committee for a little bit but he was never on the committees of jurisdiction, but he was easily one of the leading official uh, senators on the issues. So that's a, that's a really fine point that you're gonna have to figure out, but really the, the starting places are, you know, kind of members themselves that are on the committees of jurisdiction, because as you figured out, yeah, it is, it's a small, it's a niche world, it's not that large. We are um, coming up on time, but we got one more question um, from Satya. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you so much to the panelists for your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, so my name is Satya. I'm a rising junior in the School of Foreign Service studying international politics and security. Uh, and my question is about graduate school. Um, so when considering graduate programs for future work in national security or foreign policy, um, how do you go about deciding on the best program for you? And also, in your personal experience, did you pursue graduate school immediately after your undergrad or later on in your career? And what do you believe are the advantages and disadvantages of each approach. I'll jump in for, for Go ahead, Dan. On, yeah, on the lead. Um, I was really mercenary about my attitude for graduate school. And um, I uh, went to LSC for its master's program uh, immediately after Georgetown, uh, so straight into, which was a little unusual. Um, I was a little surprised that they took me, um, but I was quite, calculated about it. Um, part of my desire was where I was interested in going and doing work of some sort. I hadn't quite um, 
it hadn't clarified enough to what it was that I really wanted to do because, you know, like many of you, I was 22 and I didn't have enough experience to know what I would like and what I wouldn't by that point. Um, but I did figure that, well, if I could get a master's of some sort under my belt, uh, it would make me distinct from everybody else who had an undergraduate degree. Um, it, then I would just double back and come to Washington to work overseas. And that proved to be the case. And with that in mind, I, I thought, well, um, I had went abroad for my junior year uh, to England along with everybody else in SFM. Um, and uh, I discovered the reputation that LSC had in terms of international affairs was quite strong uh, and considered to be on a par with going to Kennedy School at Harvard or uh, Princeton and Tufts. But it had the advantage of uh, not requiring taking your GREs, being only one year instead of two, and one year at LSE was less than one year of going to Tufts. And so I thought, well, I can get the same result for less amount of money. And to be really frank, it worked. Now, I'm a generalist. And so the degree I got was in public policy, um, which is a generalist degree. If you have a specific area you want to go into, then I would counsel you to seek out the educational institution that would help you that is, you know, as expertise in that area. But I found it to be extremely useful because it was a differentiator for me. Um, that's not everybody's experience, but, you know, that's mine. Let me jump in and agree with many, well, maybe not the mercenary element, but I agree with, with a lot of what, uh, what Dan um, said. Let me just offer four points. I would definitively take time off between and, 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 and look, Dan is a great example. It can work in a lot of different ways, right? But my recommendation, if you are um, a student now and considering it, I would recommend taking one or two, or if not more years off and doing something in that time that pushes you to grow and challenge yourself to think. I, I find that I'm a professor in graduate studies, so I see graduate students, the students who have taken some time, done something, loved it or hated it, come back with a lot more focus than those who go right through. Second is the location of where you study. I am biased. I did my graduate studies in Washington. I work at a graduate school in Washington. Um, I think you should work in a city where you will have opportunities to be exposed to the people in the industries that you want. If you are interested in um, the World Bank or US politics or US foreign policy, Washington is a great place to do it. There are many other great cities in the world. So location is a second. Third, what, play, what do they specialize in? If you love human rights and democracy, who does that best? If you love national security, cyber, whatever it is. And then last, find opportunities to either do rigorous research or rigorous internships while you're at school. And I wanna, I'll just say two sentences on that. I didn't, I went to, made the mistake, I said of going to law school, not graduate school. Um, it really depends on what your issue interest areas are. If you want to study, you know, it regional area X or international security issue Y, I would encourage you as much to go for the big names of Sice and Fletcher as to actually truly find the experts in that field. And you know who's going to know the experts in your field are your current professors. You go ask them and say, who are the leading scholars on issue X? If that's what, if you really want to focus on issue X, who are the leading scholars on that? And they will tell you, oh, it's blah, 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 blah. And they will probably know them personally, actually. And that is, should be, a, it could be a consideration of well, as well as to how to focus, you know, where you might do graduate studies. Let me, I, I think that's a, an excellent point. Let me also add, um, if you are, most people coming out of, of undergrad, and not everybody, there are students of all different backgrounds. Many of you, when you come out of undergrad, are not encumbered by family or jobs or other commitments, and you have more flexibility at your age than you do, say, when you're 40. Take that time to do something that you would not necessarily be able to do, whether that is to go to the Balkans and work on peacekeeping efforts, or whether that is to go work in a humanitarian operation, or to go, um, do an election monitoring mission or do something which you are not able to pick up and do at any other time in your life um, because you will get invaluable experience. You will push yourself in ways which you um, will cry about and you'll be so excited about and you'll look back and you will not regret. But take that opportunity now to do it because it will clarify your thinking about what you want to do long term and it will push you in a way which you may not have the opportunity and ease to do at a later point in life. That's great. The only thing I would just add is if anyone is considering journalism school, um, that it, journalism is really a, a craft 
that is best learned by practicing it. And so going to graduate school for journalism is not necessarily necessary. Um, it, it really depends on if you're making a career change, if you have literally no background in, in the field to learn some of the fundamentals of it. But I firmly believe that, you know, going to a, a, a local market or small town newspaper, going overseas or something is really the best way um, to, to learn it. Um, we are actually over our time now. Um, so I just want to say a big thanks to Nicole, Mike, and Dan, um, as well as Paula um, for, for all your help setting it up. Um, I really hope that you guys um, were able to learn a lot from this. Um, I know I'll speak for myself. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions, I'm happy to give out my email address. Uh, maybe we can coordinate that through Paula or something. Um, and uh, really appreciate your time today. Thanks, everyone. That's great. Thank you, Connor. Thanks, Michael, Dan, and Nicole. We really appreciate having you on today. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Good luck. Good luck, everyone.